Now we're coming to our first panel um, of today. Um, the panel is called Global Leaders Out of Germany. Um, the host for this panel is one of our team members itself, so it's Alex Hoffmann. Thanks if you want to come to the joint. And the other players are Mark Henkel, co-founder of Paymill. Um, we have Thomas Jasombeck from the CDU here in Berlin. He's doing a pretty good job to get Angela Merkel more involved in the whole internet scene, so it's pretty important for us. And Nenad Marowak, founder of um, DN Capital. And last but not least, uh, Jan Sessenhausen, um, senior manager at High um, Tech Grab Builder Fund. Thanks. All right. Um, let's talk about uh, global leaders out of Germany. A um, couple of weeks ago, uh, Lars Henrik said uh, even the most successful startups in Berlin are irrelevant on an international scale. Basically, uh, Berlin is the hipster capital. We've got many small time outfits that don't have a substantial business model. It's unlikely that any of these businesses have a, ch a chance to grow truly big. Now, um, Ninette, what are you? biggest concerns uh, when it comes to Berlin as a startup hotspot? So one, this one can you hear me? Uh, I don't agree with Lars's comments at all. Um, I, I think Berlin has a chance to be uh, one of the most important ecosystems actually in Europe for lots of reasons. Uh, 31 universities, uh, very low pricing for rent, and also a lot of people um, in this ecosystem that are here today and all the events that you see the whole week, you don't have that anywhere in Europe, right? So I don't agree with the concept at all. Uh, in terms of, you know, if you look at Berlin versus other ecosystems in like London or Stockholm or Paris, uh, the big difference I see is um, the focus on e-commerce, right? So, and I think e-commerce is great, it's interesting, it's very fast to grow, and it plays to the strength of the Germans, which is execution. But what I want to see more of is software and more innovation. So, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Mark, um, what's your view, point of view if you're looking from Munich? From, from the Munich perspective, um, no, I think what you said is right. The rents is uh, probably one, th one thing which is uh, very good for, for, for breeding startups. Uh, what, what I think uh, to, to be a company which is worth one billion, I think you need to be very focused, but what we, we, we talked about uh, in, the, in, the, in the launch, we said it, it, there is no need to be a startup which is one billion worse. I think there is also a chance for smaller businesses. I think therefore burden is very good. It's not so interesting for uh, large VCs like you. Um, <laughs> but I think um, that this is a good breeding ground for, for, for smaller app, whatever e-commerce things, but if in terms of really big companies, um, like tech companies, like really large, large ships like Salando, I think you need to be more focused and we really step out of this startup ecosystem. And therefore, it's either Munich, it's Hamburg, it's Berlin, because mm. in, these country, uh, in these cities, um, there you have the, the, the right um, resources, the right environment, but for just for small ones, I think Berlin is perfect. You cannot take uh, Munich for, for this small ecosystem. Um, we've heard this morning that uh, one of the two, actually, of the largest drawbacks of uh, uh, Germany as a startup uh, hotspot are that there is a lack of later stage VC capital and a lack of exit opportunities. Would you agree? I, I think uh, in, the, in the last 12 to 24 months, uh, there has happened quite a lot. And I think Berlin is one of the reasons for that, because uh, all the startup scene has here a very big visibility, which you don't have in other parts of Germany. And now the startup scene is also focused by politics. Uh, as already mentioned, Angela Merkel and also Philipp Rösler are doing a lot in the meantime for, for startup scene. And uh, we try to do some things. We have the high-tech gründer for uh, Jan can say explain a little more, I guess. Um, we, we now start a new investment scheme for business angels to get subsidies uh, of 20% additional to your investments. And uh, we have quite a lot of, of, of different things. And I think it's not all about the money. It's also a question about the culture. If people in Germany get more excited about founding, uh, starting businesses. And I think there is a lot to do right now. 
and uh, what can politicians do to further foster that? Or what is being done at the moment? Yeah, but I think what's missing are idols. Yeah? If you're looking at the United States, the kids in the school are dreaming of getting the next Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg or whatever. And in Germany, if you look at uh, students of economies, uh, economy students dream of more than 50% dream of a job in the public sector. And this is a problem we have. And uh, therefore, I think we, we need more people from the startup scene, entrepreneurs which are successful, not only Hassel Plattner from SAP, but there are a lot of very smart guys who made uh, cool exits and uh, we, which must be more visible in, in, in the, on the TV or also at the schools so that the, the kids say it's cool to be an uh, entrepreneur and I, I want to do it by myself. Mm -hmm. Nenad, is that enough? Well, you know, I, uh, I think that what Ali and Lukash and Christoph and some of the other guys here in Berlin have started, you know, if you look at Berlin, it's, I think, as an ecosystem, it's 10 years old. Silicon Valley is like 40 to 50 years old, and there's, you know, a lot more capital there. So I think it's just starting, and I think give it some time, but I think there's some very interesting companies, and I think the guys look at, you know, Project A, they're starting some very interesting new companies. So the people that have made some money at Rocket, some made some money at Team Europe, they're starting new companies, and so it's just starting, you know. I mean, I don't think, uh, you can't compare it to Silicon Valley, it's still too young, but I think it has the ingredients to be extremely successful. Jan, you've got 300 million uh, euros available to invest in startups. Um, what are you looking for in a startup, in founders, uh, and where are you looking? Um, so actually we got about 600 million in if you combine the two funds, uh, so makes it even, even better. Uh, what do we look for? We are essentially looking for tech businesses and I think um, it's important that we look everywhere across Germany. We go to the universities because we think and we always find a lot of uh, exciting technologies in the, te in the universities that are not marketable yet, that are not product yet, but are like what would we think um, like really uh, the foundation of a great business and also and, and probably if we if we want to talk global leaders uh, what we don't want to find or what we don't look for is people that start talking about exit in the first five minutes because uh, if you founding a company and the first thing on your mind is the exit there's no way you're going to build a global leader it's just it's something total opposite and uh, now that we know what you're looking for, are you actually finding it? Um, yes and no. So uh, I think we have uh, shown in the history and in our portfolio that we f can find and we can build awesome companies in Germany. So we have e exciting companies in our portfolio, also like joint investments with DN Capital and, and many others. But we still think there's much more potential, especially in the tech sector. So. Uh, especially software technology, a lot of people shy away from the complexity of founding a software business. And at the, on the other hand, we have probably with SAP on the front, Germany being one of the global market leaders in software, so there's something wrong here. So we, we, we hope or we think that we can find much better investments there and we can do much better as an entire investment ecosystem. Nenad, you've closed your uh, last fund, third fund, I think, um, uh, last August. Yep. Um, back at the time, you said you're actively looking for investments here in Germany. Yep. Um, how did that work? Did you find what you were looking for? So we, um, we, uh, we closed our third fund last summer, and 76% uh, of that has been invested in Germany so far. So uh, we were only supposed to do 10% of the fund in Germany. We're already well ahead of our plan. And as a result, we want to open an office here. Uh, I think we told uh, some people here. So we think it's very interesting. And uh, also what's unbelievable is uh, there's not that much competition on the early stage. I mean, you look at Silicon Valley, uh, someone starts a company, a serial team, they can have 10 sh term sheets from, from Monday to Friday. It's a very different market here. So we find it very attractive. But, but that means that you get it cheaper in Germany, right? That's not necessarily always true. Uh, pricing, uh, you know. If you don't have competition? So, yeah, well, 
yes, but uh, there's also a, a very active angel community here, and sometimes, and this is also a big uh, thing. So, do you take money as a, as an entrepreneur at a very high valuation with angels, or take money at a fair valuation from a VC? Because sometimes you fuck up your Series A by taking the the seed money at a very high valuation, because then the ventures the capitalists don't want to fund you, and then you have this period of time where you cannot raise money because you haven't grown into your valuation. And so, you know, we like to go as early as possible so we avoid that situation, but we move quickly. So for instance, we seed finance Vinland in August 2010. We put the second money in November. We did the Series A in February. We did the Series B the following October. The company's already raised 30 million euros in less than three years. So, but quickly. But I, I spoke to... So to add on that, I think money is important and having a lot of money is important in some areas like e-commerce. In other areas, it can even be like do damage to you. If you're like building a software business or like a really tech driven business and you have too much money early on, oh. you get fat, you get excessive and you do wrong things. So it's nothing that really like money doesn't solve problems. And too much money can really be bad for you. Sure. Uh, that's uh, on the software side also, um, you know, our senior technical advisor, John Bates, uh, says software is like wine. It takes 10 years to really mature. And I think 10 years for software is probably about right. Um, if you look at, we sold, uh, well, we invested in a company called Indeca. In, it was our second investment in 2002. We sold it last year to Oracle for 1.1 billion, but it took us 10 years to get through that cycle. And so, you know, and we see that a lot with the software companies. It's 10 years to get them all the way through a cycle to get a good return. Maybe, maybe this is also one of the points uh, where we can, where we must build a better infrastructure than we have. It means technical universities. Yeah? Yeah. As you can say, we have the, the university in Aachen, which is uh, quite an excellent university. But something like this here around is missing. And so this is also a point for the government of Berlin and of Brandenburg to, to, to push more money into an excellent university for mathematics and informatics and all this, all this stuff. And also we need a reshift maybe because many people in Germany say, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not able to do maths and that's some kind of accepted. And I think that's also part of the problem. Yeah. I, I, I doubt it because I, Oh, I have, I employ 15 developers and I think five of them never finished school. They learned coding with 11 years old and doing gaming, whatever, and they never attended the university. And these guys are probably the better developers than the studied ones who started with 25 going to a corporate. Yeah. That's, that's my idea of, um, and therefore you need a culture. Um, in, in Germany, you have, we have a very, very good school and, and ecosystem. Um, I think there's no example in the world like this, but I think it's not, the parents need to tell you that's not the only way of becoming um, um, somebody who is a founder or, or something like this. Um, I think Rene Obermann, as one example, never finished university and was the CEO of, uh, of Telekom. Um, but also, my developers never. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, no, but, but I don't disagree to you. And I don't think that it's important to, to get developers. But if you look at the United States, a lot of, uh, of startups in the, which are tech technology driven yep. started at MIT or at these universities. And so this, this must be uh, relevant for this. And maybe we, we also need some kind of technology university where uh, such companies can be created. But, why, why should we again start to copy something from the U.S.? We, we could, we could, we could enhance what we are good in, in, in Europe. So, um, why, why should we now thinking of we don't have an MIT? Start an MIT in Germany, and this will solve our problems. I don't think so. No, that's not, not what I said. I said it's one, one, just one part. Yeah. So we can do this and still do the other things. So. Sure. But uh, wouldn't I, it also depend on um, the role you, you have in the, in the startup? Maybe it's, it's one thing for programmer, it might be another thing for the founder itself, because it's probably true that, that most founders did go to university, or many not, at, at least. Um, is, that, is that different, uh, Ninad, maybe from your perspective, is that different in, in other European countries, like uh, the UK or maybe uh, no, um, no, Nordics? I mean, 
No, I mean, if you look at like some of our successful software companies, I mean, Datanomic, the guy, the CTO came out of Cambridge University. He had a first in computer science. I mean, we're looking at, we're doing one right now, hybrid cluster out of Oxford. So you're right. A lot of it does come out of pretty deep academic. Coders is different, okay? But I'm talking about the guys that are the architects and the actual, you know, di you know, innovators. The guys are coming up with the actual idea and then get the coders to build the code. So I think that's the one thing where, and I said it earlier, I don't see as much coming out of that. You know, my team gets more excited about an e-commerce company, whereas I, I saw this company here called Hawker. Do you know Hawker here? In Berlin? It's this crazy technology where you can just throw data with your phone like this. I love it, my team hates it, but that's kind of crazy stuff that actually is super scalable. I mean, e-commerce is not scalable, right? It's just constantly putting ca capital, capital, capital. Look at Zalando, it's raised 800 million. I mean, it's gonna be a great hit, but you know, it's not, it's not Facebook, it's not LinkedIn. I mean, LinkedIn, look at that thing, it's just unbelievable. One piece of code sitting on servers and everyone around the world using it again and again and again. Just that's what we like. Uh, as I was looking for, for VCs, um, uh, I spoke to a lot of. My question is um, to you: uh, Do you see differences in, in founders and CEOs or whatever in, in, in Germany comparing to to Stockholm, where I met a lot of CEOs? Would I think they're different from me? Uh, what do you see for differences between them and us? It, it comes down to me to product. So, so do you think the German ones do not think about so much about product? Or? Well, e-commerce, no. E-commerce is not a technical play, right? It's an execution play. Right. Let's not confuse it. And so we see less software slash SaaS businesses, although the point nine guys have done quite a few of them recently. So we see more of just more uh, execution companies here versus innovation. Yes. It's the truth. <laughs> I mean, no? So I, Oda? Yeah, Even if SoundCloud, you're building an e SoundCloud Swedish guys then moved to Berlin. Who? Yeah. If you're building an e-commerce business, the question is, are you the smartest at attracting customers at the cheapest price? That's the number one priority probably. I, I don't do e-commerce investments, but if you're building a software firm, you have to really build a great software product and you have to be really good at selling it. At to B2B to B customers at massive prices. That's like really hard. So not many people are gonna make it, which is okay. But then if you don't, it just falls apart. It's it's like for, for us as investors, it's like black or white. If you're not good at selling it, so that's the other challenge. But wouldn't that in all consequence mean that we need to promote more software SAS? development in Berlin, and how could we do so? I think if we want to build global leaders, I think, yes, from my point of view, that is uh, part of the, uh, the assumption or the, the, the working hypothesis is build software companies, because that's what we're really good at, what we can be really good, uh, good at, and what is really a foundation of building massive businesses. Like the European businesses that went on to be, become global leaders or billion dollar businesses were mainly software businesses. And um, I think, yes, that's the working space. Yeah. I think it's a good point to see also advantages of this place here, yeah? not only talking about things to do. I think a big advantage of Berlin is that it's very attractive internationally and people from all over the world are coming here because they're somehow fascinated about the diverse city and all the way of living here. And I think this makes, people, makes it attractive to people like the ones from SoundCloud coming from Sweden to here. I mean, yep. Stockholm is also a very attractive place yep. to start a new business. And, um, and so I, I, I think this makes Berlin even more special than other cities in Germany. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, everything seems to be coming here. The, the VCs in Munich even are starting to slowly move here, right? You see the early bird guys S one by one coming, SAP. moving up here. SAP coming from Waldorf. I guess nobody here in this room knows where that exactly is. Yeah? Coming from Waldorf to Potsdam because they say yeah. they cannot get any people attracted to get to Waldorf. Right. Well, it's often been said that uh, um, German startup culture is too risk averse and that uh, we need 
or a, a culture of second chances uh, that um, in, in some point refers to uh, insolvency regulation. Um, would you agree? I mean, Leonard, you, if you, you, you've, got, you've probably got a good overview of uh, other cities. Um, what's your point? So um, as a venture capitalist, it's always more attractive to back a second time entrepreneur. But a lot of times you run into that valuation problem that we talked about before. So usually if it's a serial entrepreneur, the, the valuation goes crazy. So we're mixed. We, we're happy to look at first time entrepreneurs. And, and it's, it depends what the, what, the, what the offering is. If it's a product, then we're even more interested in, in looking at the first time entrepreneur. Because then it's really about the DNA. How well does this person know the field that he's trying to build the company in, right? Yeah. Should, but shouldn't tax regular, uh, not tax, should, shouldn't uh, law be more uh, forthcoming in that point? I, I don't believe that it's a question of law, because that's what we already discussed. If you start a business, you think about opportunities and chances and not about failing. And, uh, but I think that there is a cultural shift in the meantime, because even Angela Merkel or Philip Rösner, and in a, a lot of political discussions we now hear, the opportunity of the second chance and culture of failure. And so this is quite new. I think two years ago, nobody mentioned that in this way. And we also have example in politics. If you look at Christian Lindner from the Liberal Democrats, yeah, who's quite famous in German politics, he started a million, million, I think, D-Mark business. Some 10, 15 years ago, crashed it. And now he's one of the most famous German politicians. So we have examples. But he's not a founder anymore. So he, yeah, maybe but, but he'll <laughs> come back. Yeah, <laughs> look at the he needs to do something else. below the five percent. <laughs> but honestly, I don't think the discussion doesn't make sense. So, like, nobody who ever had a great idea or thought he had a great idea then looked up the insolvency law and thought, "No, I'm not going to do it because the insolvency law is really harsh." I, I, I don't even know the, the insolvency law, but I think it has nothing to do with that. Honestly. If, if you like believe in 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 your business and uh, and want to realize what is maybe your dream or your vision or whatever, uh, you don't think about legal constraints or like insolvency laws, honestly. But uh, do um, that's the you know startup point of view. But uh, if you look at it as an investor, do you have any? Um, anything you would ask from politicians to change in law or do, uh, in infrastructure or whatever? When he's, Thomas is sitting right next yeah, to you, I'm, so I'm just listening. ask. It's, <laughs> I think it's not the, the job of the politicians to create this startup dreamland. Um, honestly, no. It's, people, will, uh, uh, people will always discuss and, and demand more, but I think it's not the job of the politicians to do that. Um, we know uh, VCs like to make money. And uh, as a result of that, um, people often talk about rapid growth and uh, big exits. Is that something you're looking for? Is that something um, Berlin, Munich, Hamburg need to get more relevant to get, to get, the, you know, to get the message out? Yeah. Yeah. Rapid growth, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, the system doesn't work unless you yeah. have it, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we raise money from investors. We invest the money in startups and, and, and make a return and give it back to our investors, and they give us more money. But if that circle stops, i.e. no exits, the whole thing breaks down, right? So if you're an academic, your scorecard is your grades or your research papers, if you're a venture capitalist, your scorecard is your return to your investors. So yes, of course, it doesn't work otherwise. Jan? So yes, of course, at the end of the day, uh, both Nenad and myself are measured by the amount of money we return to our investors. So that's the, the only figure uh, we're measured by. Um, but I don't think that money is the number one priority or like number one topic again that solves the problems. And That's true because if we, if, if we were only money focused, we'd all be working at a private equity firm, not a venture firm. Yeah. <laughs> this is not an easy way to make money. And anybody who's in this industry knows. It's a lot easier places to make money than doing this. Yeah. But uh, how about creating jobs and uh, adding value in, in smaller markets? Yeah, I mean, it's like um, 
So I'm an early investor in Shazam. So when I invested in Shazam, it was basically you had to dial a number on a phone. And, but when I saw that the first time work in a taxi with Chris, I was like, wow, this is cool. And so now it's been, that's 2004. So what was that, like nine years since we've been invested. But watching that company grow is also very satisfying, right? It's not just about the money. So but it's a side effect. The business is not built around employing people. It's employing people to make money. Sure. And um, yeah, we've probably created 1,000, 2,000 jobs with our companies over the last 12 years. So, and, and making money for our investors. So it's a win-win situation. But if I, if I look at the uh, high tech Honda fund uh, portfolio, there are a lot of, quite a lot of smaller business that will never, you know, grow re yes. really big. Then if you say um, it's, it's necessary to, you know, at least have the potential um, why do you invest in, in many smaller businesses instead so, of picking a few? Because at the end of the day, we think and we've shown it, at least by the numbers I know, that we can make nice returns um, by smaller businesses, especially if they're tech-driven businesses. Teams of five to ten people, and especially the founders, can make themselves a really nice payday if they bootstrap or like are really hard on cash management and don't raise excessive amounts of money you, you can exit a company it's not a global leader it will it will never be but it's a really nice profitable business so and at the end of the day across the, the, the number of investments we make if we would only make investments that become billion dollar companies a we probably wouldn't make that number of investments and B we would be sitting on a really on, 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 that would be a hard ride. That would be really rough. So it's, it's also diversity. All right. Um, we've got a few couple of minutes left. Are there any questions in the audience? There's one over there, just in the back. Hi there. On? You hear me? All right. Hi, my name is Emil Lamprex. Um, I have one kind of quick question referring to the conversation earlier on. Um, talking to a lot of entrepreneurs and founders here in Berlin, I find that the definition of software seems to be ethereal to a lot of founders. Uh, sometimes that is obviously because they're maybe not paying enough attention. Uh, other times it's just because it's unclear what capital, uh, venture capital is looking for in software. I'm wondering, uh, and this is focused particularly at Nanad and Jan, what your definition of software is when you're looking for a product to invest in. So to me, software is mainly, so, I mean mainly B2B and enterprise software. I don't necessarily mean apps. That's to some degree, yeah, it's software, but it's not really, a, a, by my definition, a core piece of software, and especially a web shop, is not a piece of software to me. It's, it's not the core of the business. It's not what you're selling. So I would split it up a little differently. So enterprise software, like SAP, so enterprise sales, where you're doing licensed sales, and then you have your maintenance, and then you have your service. I mean, that's harder today, but I still think it's a very interesting business if you have the right product you're selling. Then SaaS, which is basically you know, one version of the product through the, through the, um, through the, through the cloud. Uh, and then, but the problem with the SaaS business is it takes a long time to, to get to crit break even critical mass because you, you know, you're getting paid per month, you're selling that software bit by bit on a per seat basis. But once you get traction, that's, you know, five to seven times revenue multiples, which you never get on a licensed software, right? Because usually one to two times because of the service element. And then apps. I mean, apps are unbelievable, right? I mean, Shazam app, um, you know, Evernote. Um, you know, we, I think there's the whole space, and you know, with with the smartphone, with accelerometers, with GPS, you can do so many cool things that you could never do before, right? So that's software. And then now with HTML5, where you can basically create one version and then have it go through your, you know, your iPad, your phone, your your your, your browser as well. It's, it's unbelievable. So that's how we would look at software. And I think, honestly, apart from e-commerce, everything digital is software, right? 
so, and I have a different view for, for like the Shazam example. I would only consider the core technology. What makes Shazam unique, the recognition part is probably the software part to me. Everything that's interface, yeah, that's nice, but that's not really a key differentiator. So I would disagree completely on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the algorithm we de de developed to, to recognize a song is great, but then if all you do is recognize a song, you know, that's not going to really do much. But it's the all integration of you know, what you do on the end of the tag, and now as we move to Shazam for TV, which is you tag an advertisement or a TV program, and then we own the second screen. So we control what the, 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 the broadcaster or the advertiser wants you to see on the screen. And there's some really cool stuff. So you can actually watch a skiing competition where they're skiing down, and then someone can have a camera on their helmet, and you're not, you can actually see on the second screen them skiing between the, the gates. And you have to see some of the stuff. There's some, some of it's on YouTube already, but it's unbelievable, and it's all software. Uh, but it's cool stuff. I, I, what, you see, uh, what you said is, is interesting, because you, you said before, uh, also B2B and software as a service companies need developers and sales and marketing, or sales. Uh, I, I think people who thought of software as a service companies think it's a bunch of people, just techies, but I think it's also very important, um, or very interesting jobs for sales and, and marketing persons, because um, what, what we are facing with, with my company, uh, we are B2B, and it's for us very hard um, to, to sell the product. Um, it's, it's not as scalable as e-commerce in, in terms of online marketing, where you just have some triggers, and you spend more money on, on, on AdWords, and, and your sales goes up. Um, I think I'm working with 20 developers, and we have 10 people from from business perspective, and it's very interesting. And also, um, as a as a business guy, um, it, it's um, it's a nice area to work with these developers. And you, you don't need to be a geek to, to, to work in a software company. That's what, all I uh, want to add here, because you said that these guys are good in product, but not good in marketing usually. What? Well, well. If I have, would, 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 uh, can have a wish, yeah? I, I think what Jan said some time ago is right, that politics cannot build up the perfect entrepreneurships or the perfect startups. That's the work that you have to do. But what I would wish would be more companies in, in uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge uh, analysis like Google does or social media like Facebook does. And so. I think maybe we have also a problem with all the data, data privacy uh, laws we have in the meantime in, in Europe, not only in Germany. Uh, but I think this is, for the future, very important. And I think these are very powerful databases. And if they are all going abroad, we will become different problems than only the question about how many jobs which uh, are created. OK, more questions? That's one. Interestingly, I just really had a question from before that was relating exactly to what you just said. Uh, just wanted to uh, address the gentleman from the Bundestag. Uh, uh, there was a question, can the state actually help out uh, creating this entrepreneurial um, environment in Berlin or Germany? And I just wanted to say that this really the state can actually help a lot. And uh, for example, if you take the Bürgeramt, there's tons of foreigners who come here to Berlin yeah. and to Germany to, you know, power up your own entrepreneurial uh, environment and your startups. And it's really difficult to handle all this that comes after you land to uh, Germany. So uh, <laughs> just, uh, I just wanted to ask also, like, if there's any plan, how to, do you plan in any way, like, to ease up actually uh, grabbing uh, mind force from, uh, even neighboring European countries and like put them to work for the German startup scene. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Spain. Yeah, uh, uh, interesting. Uh, most people coming from uh, from other countries are coming more from the eastern of Europe than from from Spain or Greece. So, so the people from Spain or Greece are more going to UK. It seems for for some reason, maybe because of the language. Um, I think the language barrier is really a problem, and I'm also angry about Berlin that you still have all these forms to fill out in German, 
And in my constituency, so I can make a commercial break for my constituency, that's Düsseldorf. <laughs> we also have successful startups there, Trivago, for instance. Yeah? And uh, in, in Düsseldorf now, we're starting with English forms because of that, to make it easier for people to come to our, to our city and, and to bring their expertise there. Okay, another question? If that, that's one. So just kind of following on from there, I, my name is Mark Lever, I work as an advisor for the British government. Um, and I'm interested in when American startups pitch, they talk about platform investment exit. When British startups pitch, they talk about design, culture, and user experience. And I'm interested in this idea of how the state can be involved to innovate and catalyze a point of difference to Berlin. I was very interested by your comment earlier about creating a point of difference rather than recreating an American model. So to follow on that point, with your kind of catalyst investments with the Gründerfund, would you, are you trying to create uh, a different type of culture with Berlin uh, startups, a different type of thing, not just recreate e-commerce companies? Is there something that this place does which is entirely different? Is it direct, direct toward me? So, so answering from our, uh, our work, we do not try to create culture or anything. It's not our job, our mission, or even what we think is really helpful for us. What we try to create is an understanding, especially within the universities, that founding a company or taking this piece of technology that you've worked on in the last, over the last three, four, five years, and is sitting there on the shelf, that that is something you can build a company around. Just like that spark of, hey, I can actually do something with that and not just leave it behind and work for some corporate. Um, besides that, it's not, we, we, are not trying to, we, we are not trying to change the culture, no. I think culture has to evolve by itself, it's nothing you can really create. I, I, I agree. Uh, I don't think that the government should should focus on the culture of, of startups. Uh, I mean, I mean, this is coming from itself, from you as a scene. You are, you will be find positions how how to uh, how to separate from from other cities or other cool places in the world and what, what's the benefit of Berlin and what maybe is the Berlin style and mm -hmm. if you're looking at the streets you can see people looking different than in other German countries or maybe different than uh, everywhere else in the world and you see in, in, in music there is a, a Berlin style, you have this electro music, you hear that when you're going in the park on Sunday you always hear this electro music and so there is a, cr create, a, a culture has created by the city itself and I think this will also reflect on the on a sure. startup scene, and I don't think that this is government business, for sure not. Can we get a microphone, please? Yeah, we, we try to support by, 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 by um, spending some money, by giving the funds uh, to, to give them some platforms to support events and everything like this. But what we don't uh, discuss in Parliament, what is the right culture? Also. But I don't think that you wanted this from us. Mm -hmm. yeah. We support. Things coming up, we will support, yes. All right. Uh, running out of time, I've got one last question. Um, what are your three hottest startups in Germany right now? Mark. My own one, Paymill. <laughs> uh, um, um, certainly, I saw uh, in Düsseldorf Emma's Enke, which is uh, something like uh, Tante Emma Laden uh, with an, uh, uh, in, in, uh, a shelf which is in the internet, which is a small startup, but I really think uh, I, I like these old ones. And um, I like Wine and Black. Yeah. <laughs> But guys, that's my, my humble opinion. That's not something from a VC perspective, which will be a $1 million business once. Yeah, you so. know. You know. It's a big business. Yeah. So a company I really like uh, is, is, uh, is Passstream. They're from Cologne. They are a database technology company, not our portfolio. Um, they went straight from to the US. Really awesome technology de developed on, over many years. Um, probably have to say one for my personal portfolio, which is, uh, so the biggest one of my companies is Trademob. I think that's doing really well. And kind of have to pass on on the third one right now because I can't up my mind. 
Yes, I totally agree to Mark. Yeah, to, as a tribute to my constituency, I also like Emma's Enkel, met them at the Cebit, and also Trivago. And, and as I like games, uh, I'm fascinated about Vuga. And that's so uh, one of the fastest companies we've ever invested in is a company called Vindlin.de, which is basically giving everything for the mother. And uh, so that's Vin one. Vindlin.de. Vindeln. Vindeln. I can never For pronounce the German it. German speakers. <laughs> Vindeln. Sure. Yes, it's, uh, it's a shitty business, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we like it. It does very well. Uh, Mr. Specs, of course, our Berlin uh, local company. And then Scarozzo. And I've even been wearing their shoes today. So if you want to buy a nice pair of shoes, scarozzo.com. And then uh, I like Lukash's Delivery Hero. I mean, Delivery Hero, I hear great things. And yeah. Zalando, of course. But Zalando, I mean, that's... Uh, I think kind we're of just waiting for the IPO, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Mark, Jan, Thomas, Nina, thanks for participating. Thank you. Um, everyone, thanks for being here. Um, now we've got lunch break. So go off, mingle, network, have fun. Yeah.